Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, I have with me today um, Dr. or soon to be Dr. Uh, Kane Baker will be defending his thesis um, here in the next, what, month, month and a half or so? Coming up soon. Yeah. Well, hopefully. Um, the, uh, they're actually, it might not be that soon because there is a strike going to yeah. happen at some point. Um, and so, although it's currently scheduled for June the 1st, it might be later than that if that happens to be the day when people are striking. God, believe it or not, I'm actually attending a university in the UK as well, though at a distance, obviously, uh, at, at Staffordshire. So my, um, my PhD advisor, I, I'm, I'm aware of the strike, yes. <laughs> uh, so Kane, let's, um, how about you start us off by telling us about your uh, general background in philosophy and kind of what you're focusing on as far as your PhD goes. Yeah, well, uh, I guess I've, I mean, I've been in philosophy for a fairly long time now. I did my degree in philosophy uh, and then I did my master's in philosophy and did PhD that's in philosophy. Um, I've I guess focused mainly on philosophy of science. Um, I would say that I'm sort of broadly interested in a lot of different areas of philosophy in kind of contemporary like western philosophy that's that's basically what I was educated in. You know, I, I'm I'm not really so hot when it comes to stuff like ancient philosophy. But if it's yeah. if it's like philosophy in the English speaking world from the last you know hundred years or so, um, I think I, I I have a pretty good background in that particular area. Um, and uh, I mean more more precisely, my main interest for a long time was the scientific realism debate and I, I guess we can maybe talk about what that is a bit later but uh, that's what my BA dissertation, my MA dissertation and my PhD are all broadly speaking concerned with. All right, Intr I definitely want to come back to that. Um, before we kind of delve into the specifics, um, I would like for us to kind of start big picture maybe for those who aren't as familiar with uh, specific areas of philosophy. So um, however you wanna approach this in your own words, uh, what is the philosophy of science? Uh, maybe what do you see as some of the major problems, uh, problems or areas of interest slash investigation when it comes to the philosophy of science kind of broadly construed? So I guess, um... You know, the way, well, yeah, it's always a hard, I always find that question really hard. Like, you know, what is, what is the philosophy of X? So, right. I mean, I guess you can broadly think of philosophy of science as involving like questions about science. Um, well, I mean, like, I don't know, there, 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 are, there, are, there are sort of two big major camps, I suppose. On the one hand, philosophers of science will kind of sometimes like step back from science and ask these broad questions about it. So they'll ask a question like, you know, well, what is science, right? What is the distinction between science and pseudoscience? What is the scientific method? Um, you know, like uh, 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 what, what are the sort of processes by which, you know, scientific theories are, um, uh, are, are assessed? You know, what are the criteria for assessing scientific theories, right? Those sorts of questions. And then you also get philosophers of science who sort of apply philosophical tools to scientific problems. Um, so in this case, this would be this kind of philosophical work is, is a bit more continuous with science itself. Um, so uh, I, uh, what would be a good example? Something like maybe... Um, It's kind of hard to come up. Okay, well, maybe stuff like, for instance, interpretations of quantum mechanics. Um, that's probably something that I, you know, people will have a lot, a lot of, you know, if, if you're, if you have an interest in science, you've probably heard of this, right? Like this is something that um, scientists are debating, but this raises a lot of questions that are often considered to be more philosophical. So philosophers have contributed to that debate as well. Um, so yeah, I think that, very broadly speaking that's what philosophy of science is it's either going to be like 
philosophical questions about science or the application of philosophical tools to scientific problems. Mm. Uh, what do you think does that does that make sense <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense to me yeah um i i found i mean it, it is a difficult question to answer because um I, i'm interested in the philosophy of science as well but i'm approaching it from a more historical perspective right mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm looking at uh specifically like historical problems and situations specifically in like early 20th century physics and like how Einstein's theory of relativity was received and interpreted by philosophers at the turn of the century. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different moving parts. And when somebody says philosophy of science, they could mean a whole host of things. But I like that distinction that you made. I think that works pretty well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so where do you see yourself in, in that split that you made? Uh, do you see yourself kind of dealing with kind of these meta questions related to science or do you kind of see yourself firmly within the field of like philosophy of physics or philosophy of biology or something like that um so i i think that like any philosopher of science probably has you know particular sciences that they're you know more familiar with i mean i um i'm certainly like i i would say like philosophy of biology was um something that i've had kind of more training in um so um I don't really know much about physics right so um but no i i'm more I, I i'm more interested in the kind of meta questions and i think in many ways i'm um i i'm actually a, a very sort of traditional philosopher um like i mean my background is very firmly philosophy um and in some ways i sort of i don't know kind of stumbled into philosophy of science it's it's a bit difficult to say how that happened it just became the thing that interested me the most um but it, i became interested in it because like you know there, there are some people who find their way into philosophy of science because they start off doing science and then they find themselves intrigued by these more philosophical questions and they sort of end up going into philosophy that was how my supervisor did he started off in physics yeah. and ended up as a philosopher um but with me it was the other way around like I started off in philosophy um and I think what attracted me to philosophy was that it allowed me to um <laughs> philosophy allows you to just deal with like all sorts of different things so like one one minute you can be doing philosophy of science the next minute you can do ethics the next you can do yeah. philosophy of mind you know you can so you never get bored because you've got all of these different things that you can you know jump from one thing to another right um but I was you know always very interested in questions like about sort of knowledge like mm. what are the limits of of our knowledge how much can we know about the world and of course um it seems pretty plausible that you know the best mechanism we have the best method we have for figuring out what the world is like um is going to be science so you know i'm i ended up just attracted to philosophy of science for that reason um but the point of all of this is, uh, I think I'm a sort of traditional philosopher looking at science in a, a fairly traditionally philosophical sort of way. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so let's let's talk about you brought up uh, realism, right? And I would I would say, and you know, of course, this is a philosophical conversation so feel free with to disagree with how i'm framing this right but um going back to that distinction one of the meta questions uh of science is kind of what exactly are scientific theories or scientific descriptions of the world what are they getting at and what are the nature of these descriptions so if, if you could frame what is realism what is scientific realism? What are some of the other positions um, that you've encountered that other philosophers take? Uh, instrumentalism, maybe. Um, and then we, we, maybe we can get into a little bit of your specific position. So, uh, yeah, so I think realism is kind of the, the common sense view of what scientific theories are doing and what science is doing. So um, re realism says that 
our best scientific theories provide us with true descriptions of the world. So, or, or a realist might say something like, you know, um, science aims to provide true descriptions of the world. And um, for at least some of our theories, we are justified in believing that they provide true descriptions of the world. Um, so like, you know, when you, I don't know, encounter some phenomenon in the world, um, like say the Aurora Borealis, well, there's gonna be uh, probably a scientific model that provides some explanation of that thing. Uh, which is going to appeal to all sorts of entities and processes beyond what you observe. In the case of the aurora, um, our best theories tell us a story um, which I guess simplifying would say that there are like charged particles coming from the sun, they're caught in the earth's magnetic field, um, the magnetic field you know directs them down to the, down to, uh, the polar regions and then uh, they collide with molecules in the atmosphere and that interaction results in the production of light. And so what we have is, you know, we have this story about magnetic fields and charged particles, um, you know, and the uh, activity going on in the sun and uh, photons and all of this stuff. And, um, you know, this goes well beyond what we can visually perceive or detect with any of our other senses. So a scientific realist will say um, that story is true. Uh, the entities and processes described in that model really exist. Um, and um, they are pretty much, they, they pretty much behave in the way that the model describes. Um, now, of course, you know, realists uh, are, are going to recognize that there are limits to what we know. Uh, we don't know everything about the world. And realists will also recognize that we're probably wrong in some respects, right? So, um, you, you know, we have to kind of be careful not to straw man the position, right? Like they're not saying that it's, <laughs> that, that, we, that we've got like a perfect knowledge, right? So, you know, mm. usually they'll say something like, well, our best theories are approximately true. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's basically realism. Um, I, I guess then the, the, the way to sort of, see it is that it involves a commitment to the idea that there is a mind independent world um, that our theories are supposed to be providing true descriptions of that world and that they are sometimes successful in doing so so um anti-realism is like a, a, just a family of positions that deny this story in one way or another um, so one view you might take is that uh, theories aren't really to be interpreted literally. So when scientists talk about things like electrons and photons, um, they're not really even trying to describe things in the world. Instead, talk of electrons and photons is um, uh, either just like meaningless or it's to be reinterpreted in terms of claims about things that we can observe. So like, you know, when I say that an electron has done something, maybe we should reinterpret that in terms of a set of claims about what I observe when I look at a cloud chamber, or something like that. This kind mm. of view isn't really so popular anymore, although there are still a couple of people defending it. But um, I, think, I think the more sort of common approach these days to anti-realism um, is just to sort of deny the, uh, the claim about justification. It would be to say, well, you know, yeah, theories are trying to provide true descriptions of the world, um, but actually we're not justified in assuming that they're successful at that. Um, so, you know, the, I, I think the, more po the most popular form of anti-realism would be to say that what you get from science is uh, very powerful tools for predicting, explaining, controlling what we observe, um, but we should just be agnostic concerning the claims that those theories make beyond the observable. So to kind of follow up there, I myself uh, in the area that I focus on don't really get into a lot of these debates and distinctions. Um, would it be correct to say that most of the time that I see like 
anti, well, okay. Two things I want to do. Um, one is, in my experience, trying to explain this to students, um, I oftentimes get like really puzzled looks. And the first question is like, well, what do you mean science doesn't describe reality? Like, <laughs> isn't that the whole point of it? Um, so maybe if you could provide like a concrete example of two or two of what, what you mean there. And secondly, maybe building off of that, like, it seems to, my, to me in my experience that most anti-realist positions are anti-realist with respect to um, phenomenon that's largely described mathematically. Like you don't really see a lot of, and you tell me if I'm wrong, you don't really see a lot of anti-realist positions in like subjects like biology or geology. It's, it's mostly with respect to physics, right? So yeah, how would you approach those? Okay, yeah. Um, well, all right. So I think that the, the, the most sort of, well, what I've found the best way to make this kind of view intuitive um, is to point to the history of science. Now, I, I, I don't think that this is actually such a good argument for anti-realism, but I do think it helps just to sort of illustrate why someone might be an anti-realist, why you might take the position seriously. So if you look at the history of science, you find lots of cases where there are theories that were successful, you know, they made correct predictions, um, you know, they seem to provide compelling explanations of, uh, of phenomena, um, but they have since been rejected, um, or at least we no longer think that they're true. So you know, you find phlogiston theories in chemistry, uh, you know, of, of like phlogiston theory of combustion, um, you find uh, caloric theories of heat, uh, th like these theories are just not part of contemporary science. Um, similarly, you find things like Newtonian mechanics, which, I mean, in a sense, is still part of contemporary science um, in the, you know, we still, we still use Newtonian mechanics, we still use it to do things like send probes to Pluto. Um, but we think that in terms of its description of the underlying structure of space-time, it's, it's just wrong. Um, so it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's very right with respect to how certain observable phenomena behave. You know, if you want to talk about things like the orbits of the planets and swings of a pendulum and things like that, um, it is an extremely powerful tool, uh, but you know the, the claims it makes about like the, un, the you know the underlying structure of the universe uh, it just seems to be incorrect about that. It's been displaced by by relativity. So so um, the same. So so then we can sort of think, well, you know, maybe we're in the same position today as scientists were in the eighteen hundreds. You know, if you go back to the eighteen hundreds. They would have said, well, you know, of course Newtonian mechanics is true. You know, look at the incredible, incredibly powerful predictions it makes, right? No other, nobody else has come up with a theory that's anywhere close to being as powerful as this theory is. You know, it's, it's like there's more evidence for this than there is for any theory of anything in all of human history. Like, clearly this is correct. This is the way the world works. But then, you know, you go forward 100 years and it turns out, nope, <laughs> nope, they were wrong. So... You know, um, that, that kind of thought might, might motivate um, uh, like anti-realism. And it, I, I think one thing that is worth bearing in mind is that, you know, like, ag again, we still use Newtonian mechanics. So we are all anti-realists about that. So there's, there you have a theory where like, we can all agree that the uh, anti-realist interpretation is, uh, is the right one. Um, so yeah, hope, does that, I mean, I don't know, does that, uh, <laughs> Do you think that 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 helps to make it intuitive? Yeah, I I think it does. I think I can see where you're coming from there. So, the looking back on the history of science, kind of the the, the history of progress, so to speak, especially I think physics probably provides the most clear example here. The absorption of Newtonian mechanics into relativity, um, we no longer. We no longer assume things like uh, absolute time and space that Newtonian mechanics was predicated on, but we still accept the um, 
mathematical structure that it provided, right? Mm -hmm. So, but that structure isn't descriptive in the way that it we once understood it to be. I don't know if I helped clear that up at all. But <laughs> that's me trying to follow along. I don't know. No, I, I, I think, I, I think no, that 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 seemed like a pretty good summary. Um, you know, it's. Uh, I, I mean, look. I, I guess it's like, look. If you if you were to ask, you know, any physicist, okay, so do you think that Newtonian mechanics is true? I mean, what would they say to that? I mean, at the very least, they're not just going to say, "Oh, yes, it is," right? I mean, it's like, well, <laughs> they'd be saying, "Well, maybe it's true in these particular respects," but like. Um, I know. I think today what they would say is, well, look, if you want to know what the what like what's what the truth is, well, now we need to talk about theories like general relativity and quantum mechanics. Mm. Um, so, <clears throat> I I mean, yeah. So that, I like that. I think I think that that that's the sort of thing that kind of motivates anti-realists is that it seems like we can have theories that get a lot of things wrong, but that are still very successful um mm -hmm. yeah you had uh, a, another question that <laughs> but i can't remember what the question was you'd, you'd asked about examples you'd asked for examples and then there yes. was this other question which i forgot oh yeah. it was about uh physics mathematics and like you don't get anti-realism so much in biology and yeah yeah um yeah i think um i i think that what's going on here is that for a long time philosophy of science <laughs> sort of was just philosophy of physics um uh you know like that's that's a bit of a simplification but you know um if you kind of look at like philosophy of science in you know sort of before the 1950s that the focus was on physics and um in those sort of earlier years philosophers of science tended to be more anti-realist right so um like the logical positivists they tended to be committed to, to anti-realism as a result of their philosophical commitments um and 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 then you know when you get when philosophers start getting interested in biology and so on um i mean i'm not sure if maybe it's just that they kind of moved on from the realism anti-realism debate um it's also i think that uh uh realism became more of a consensus position um but i actually think uh no i think that the kind of the same sort of arguments apply regardless of whether we're talking about physics or um you know biology say um mm -hmm. in fact i think that you know in in some ways there might be arguments for anti-realism that are um kind of more I don't, I don't necessarily want to say they only apply in the biological domain, but it's more obvious how to make those arguments with respect to biology. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess I could go into that. Uh, yeah, but, please. That'd yeah. be awesome. Um, okay, so for instance, what you find in biology, I think, is it's... Hang on. Right, okay. So uh, I was talking about about anti-realism in biology. So, okay, uh, let's take, for instance, species, right? This is a um, pretty central concept in biological science. Um, and there's a question about, well, okay, what exactly is, what exactly is a species? Uh, and when you look at the uh, literature on this, it turns out that there's a whole load of different um, species concepts. So there's a whole load of different ways of um, sort of sorting organisms into different species. So for example, there is um, what's known as the biological species concept, which says that two organisms are in, in the same species if they are capable of interbreeding. Um, there's the uh, ecological species concept, which defines species in terms of the ecological niche that they exist in. There are phylogenetic species concepts, which are more like historically based. Um, th th there's, it, when, you, when you like look into this, it's like I don't know about 30 different species concepts um so um and, and you find the same with other sort of biological concepts as well like the concept of a biological individual or biological organism and so on now one sort of view that you might take um when dealing with this with this problem um when dealing or dealing with the question of like what is a species is a kind of 
is, is to say, well, you know, there isn't really a fact of the matter in the world. Um, it's, it's sort of up to us in some sense. So it'd be a kind of like, um, you know, constructivism. We might say that species are not, you know, natural kinds, but that, you know, it's ultimately, the species concept we use is ultimately just a matter of, I don't know, whichever one happens to be the most convenient to us um, or whichever one uh, 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 best helps to realize particular research goals. For example, um, the interbreeding species concept is kind of impossible to, to, to like apply in the context of um, maybe like historical studies of populations where we're not going to be able to know whether or not like, you know, which populations were capable of interbreeding with other populations. Um, so, um, like, in that case, it's, you know, we can't apply that concept, so that's not the concept we use. So we use a different one, you know. So um, I'm, I'm not sure if that made sense, but, like, that's yeah. a case where, you know, that might motivate sort of anti-realist interpretations in biology. No, I think I follow that. I think that's a good example. So if we take something as to, to better understand the anti-realist position. So if we take something as seemingly concrete as species, as a concrete category of species, once we start to examine it, what we find is that the category itself is not so concrete and that the actual the actual uh, animals, organisms that we're studying don't fit neatly into that. So what that might show us is that this, what we once thought to be a concrete category is just a this sort of application that we as humans are imposing on the world, not a, a, a black and white structure that exists in the world itself. Yeah. Would that be a right so, way of um, looking at it? Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, that's that's exactly it. Um, there's a really nice example of this, actually, which I'll, I'll just say. Um, so if you look, there's, there's um, populations of gulls around the Arctic that form what are called ring species. So if you start in kind of, you know, like let's start here, right? You have a population of gulls here and these can interbreed, like population A can interbreed with population B. And then you have like population C like population B can interbreed with population C, population C can interbreed with population D. And it goes around in a ring around the Arctic until you have population A and population Z, and they can't interbreed, mm. right? So, so now let's take our concept of species as uh, organisms that can interbreed. It's like, well, what do we say about, about A and Z? Because they can't interbreed with each other, but A can interbreed with B, B can interbreed with C all the way around. So like if you follow the ring round, then you get the claim that they're the same species. So, you know, which species concept do we apply here? Well, notice it's like, it, it, if we decide to like do, if we are engaging in some sort of study of, uh, you know, the local ecosystem in the area where A and B coexist, or A and Z coexist, um, you can apply the interbreeding concept and it's perfectly fine, doesn't cause any problems because you've got two clearly defined populations of goals. And, you know, it's like this population can't interbreed with this population, so they're different species. On the other hand, if you're looking, you know, if you sort of expand your scale of analysis, oh, suddenly our ability to apply that concept breaks down. Um, but that's obviously dependent on our research goals. It's like, you know, if we choose, to, to adopt a narrow, like very specific scale of analysis, then we can apply this concept. If not, we can't. Um, so maybe that, well, I don't know. That's, that's just a nice example of some of the issues that arise with trying to define, uh, trying to define species, yeah. Gotcha. So let's, uh, let's build out from maybe using that specific example. What are the, philosophical implications of, of that? Like, is this some sort of demonstrative proof that uh, science doesn't describe reality or maybe that it's a constructive model like you <laughs> talked about before? Like, what can we derive from that example? Well, uh, <laughs> no, I, I mean, I don't think that you really get knocked down arguments uh, for anything in, in philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there are, there are ways of, of dealing with this. 
kind of problem from a more realist point of view. I mean, you might actually, as a realist, just kind of accept that, okay, like maybe when biologists talk about species, right, maybe, maybe, the, maybe species that is constructed, like that's just a, a sort of useful classification for us, but that doesn't stop us from, you know, making all sorts of other true claims about the biological world, right? So obviously I've only just given one example here, um, but any realist is going to accept that there are cases where we simplify and idealize um, and the fact that we do that sometimes that doesn't stop us from getting at the truth in in other cases um, so you know it's, it, 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 uh, so like um, I get you know there, there's lots of there's lots of examples like this like like the fact that sometimes it's useful for us to use Newtonian mechanics because it has you know it simplifies the equations uh, <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't mean that we have we are failing to get at the truth in other cases right, right. so um that's one thing we could say another thing um we can say is um so in the case of something like species you might say well look the way that um philosophers have maybe traditionally thought about uh natural kinds um let's say is is just mistaken um and you know like kinds do not have to be defined in terms of sort of necessary and sufficient properties or anything like that it's enough for there to be a kind of you know cluster of uh, properties um that are perhaps vaguely defined um that can still be you know that's that's still like a fact about the world that you know there are certain clusters of populations um, or clusters of organisms that are, um, you know, organized in a particular way. So, yeah, there are, there are you know, realist uh, responses. Gotcha. Where do you see yourself on this spectrum? Um, are you a, a staunch defender of either position? Kind of where, where do you fall here? And maybe we can get into a little bit of what you're writing about as far as your thesis goes. Yeah, well, I'm, uh, I'm an anti-realist. Um, and uh, I think the, the main reason why I'm an anti-realist is that it seems to me that realism is, I think, pretty much always going to rely on some sort of what we might call success to truth inference. Mm. So the claim is, is going to be that, you know, our, that we have certain theories that are successful in some respect. Usually it, it, it's going to be something like these theories make successful novel predictions. Um, so that just means like a prediction of a phenomenon that would, that, that was, would have been, you know, that, that was otherwise unexpected, that was surprising, um, and that turned out to be correct. So for instance, like Einstein's prediction of the value of uh, light bending around the sun, right? Okay, nobody had any, had any other reason to make that prediction, right? His theory made that prediction, turned out to be correct. Um, similarly, Mendeleev's prediction of the, um, we, uh, he predicted like three elements and their properties, I can't remember exactly which ones they were, um, on the basis of his periodic table, and those predictions were confirmed. Um, we did, you know, we found those elements. So that sort of thing, you know, it's like, okay, we have this like remarkable success, and um, it's that that is sort of doing the work in terms of letting us infer the truth of these theories. Um, so, like, the best explanation for why science is so successful in this respect is that it gets at the truth um i mean there are other motivations for realism um but i think that plays a very significant role uh for the majority of realists um and i just don't find that convincing um so i think that's probably the, the main reason why i tend to be an anti-realist um so yeah, I think I think that 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 that, that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, well, let's unpack that a little bit. Um, what what maybe 
best evidence. I don't know if I want to phrase it that way. Um, we'll just start off with why don't you find that description convincing? <laughs> Do you think that it's wrong? Do you think that it's um, misguided? Does science not really function that way? Um, yeah, however you want to interpret that. Oh, well, so science does function in the sense that it, you know, allows us to, you know, it, it produces these kind of correct novel predictions in the, in the way that I said, and it is, it is remarkably successful. So um, I guess that's probably kind of an important thing to, to, uh, to say is that like um, anti-realists generally speaking are not in any sense like anti-science. I mean, right. um, it, generally speaking, anti-realists do not rest their case on the claim that science isn't successful in the ways that we usually think it is. So, you know, yeah, it like it really does produce predictions that are very surprising, like surprising in their you know like success. Um, so, you know, these theories have incredible predictive power, and they support um, remarkable, you know, technological developments and all of that stuff. Um, so, I think that. Um, the problem that I have is that there are there are theories that are false but successful mm. and we've already kind of covered that in some respects because you know we've talked about how well historically okay we can find some examples of this I think perhaps to me the the, the point that's maybe even more compelling is that we actually find this even when we look at contemporary science so we find lots of cases where scientists will appeal to idealizations when modeling phenomena. Um, so just for just one example of this, um, it, when scientists model stars, they will model them uh, as if they were composed of ideal gases. And we know that nothing in the world is an ideal gas. Uh, so, you know, this is this, this kind of thing, like the use of idealizations um, is, it's, it's pretty ubiquitous throughout the sciences uh but you know it's like well that's 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 a falsehood right it's um you know if you have like a model of the sun of the behavior of the sun that treats it as if it's composed of an ideal gas well in that respect it's false um and yet it may still make very powerful predictions um it may still be sort of integrated with the rest of our other theories in a very systematic way um, so, uh, yeah, so you, we have cases where theories are false but successful. Um, I think the other thing is that, you know, one of the things I mentioned when I was introducing realism is that um, realists do not claim that our best theories are true, period, uh, because that would just obviously be implausible. Mm -hmm. um, no, they'll claim that they're approximately true. But the problem with that is that 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 I think seriously weakens the the explanation that they're trying to give. So when they say, "Well, you know, we we've noticed that science is remarkably successful," um, we can explain that by supposing that the theories are true. Well, it's like yes, if the theories were true, then presumably they would be successful. They would make um, correct predictions because if a theory is true, it's going to be true for the observable phenomena. So the predictions it makes are going to be true. Um, but it's not obvious that that works if you're saying that the theory is approximately true. Um, because an approximately true theory might make completely false predictions. Uh, so like maybe one way to think about this is um, there is, I'm not actually sure what the status of this is anymore, but like um, there were, there, there was a time when people suggested that um, the, the you know the sort of uh, con that sort of certain constants in the universe are sort of very finely tuned to life right mm -hmm. now I, I i don't know whether that's true um but like the the idea would be that if you know the strong nuclear force were ever so slightly stronger then the universe would have collapsed like a millisecond after the big bang right mm -hmm. um so okay let, like in that case then right we can just take sort of contemporary physics make the strong nuclear force slightly stronger. And then we have a theory that's still approximately true. Like presumably if contemporary physics is approximately true, then 
contemporary physics with a slightly stronger nuclear force would be approximately true as well. But now it's not going to be making correct predictions about anything, right? It's going to be making a disastrously wrong prediction because yeah. it predicts that the universe, you know, is uh, like less than a millisecond old. Um, yeah, the universe collapses after a millisecond. Well, that's a disastrously wrong prediction. Um, so, you know, like, again, I'm not sure if that particular example works, but it's, uh, I, I, I don't know what the current um, physical science says about this fine tuning stuff, but, you know, hopefully that illustrates the point, right? That like by slightly modifying the claims that are made about the underlying structure and nature of the universe, you can get completely different predictions. Um, so, yeah, um, plenty of cases where we find false but successful models, and I think also cases where there are approximately true but unsuccessful ones, and um, I would suggest that that uh, uh, challenges the success to truth inference. Okay, I I think I'm following. Let me let me try to clarify it for myself, and uh, maybe this will be helpful for somebody else out there that listens to it. So I, I can think of. All right, well let me let me phrase it like this first. So, is what you're saying? I think I think I what I heard you saying. If so, we're dealing with approximations from the realist standpoint. And these approximations, one way to phrase this might be like these approximations don't ne necessarily have to be true so long as they're useful. Like if, if I'm, uh, I'll just give an example. So like um, a lot of, if, if, you look, if you look at relativity from a historical uh, lens and not, not everything that happened in the 30s, 40s, and 50s that empirically verified relativity. There was a lot of claims that Einstein had that um, we just didn't know if they were true. But, mm -hmm. and we couldn't know at the time, but the, um, the, the, the formulations, uh, uh, the mathematical calculations that Einstein gave were the, the structure that he built off of that was worked really well in a way that um, previous iterations didn't. Like we, we no longer needed uh, superficial concepts like uh, an ether. Uh, we didn't have to explain things like ether drag anymore. We were kind of liberated from that and what Einstein gave us worked. Um, maybe string theory would be a, a contemporary example of this. As far as I'm aware, I could be <laughs> completely wrong about this. Um, but the, the claims of the string theory and the mathematical superstructure of th string theory hasn't been empirically verified, right? So it, it might be the case that it's, it works, we can utilize it, we can work with the models provided by it, but that it might not be like physical, if that makes sense. Would that um, be an implication or did I just completely misread that? Well, uh, I, I mean, I would go a bit further and say, you know, like if it, even if it is empirically verified, um, I don't think we have to, I mean, I certainly think we're sort of compelled to infer that the theory is, is true. Mm. Um, I don't think we're compelled to infer that the claims that the theory makes beyond the observable phenomena. So like a theory is going to, um, you know, it's, it's going to, make a whole bunch of claims about what the observable phenomena does. I mean, that's how it makes predictions, right? Um, this is maybe, maybe this is kind of simplifying. Uh, this might not be like, like exactly the right way to put it. Some people will object to the idea that like theories make claims because maybe theories aren't really linguistic structures, but like putting all of that aside, you know, um, it, you know, it, it seems like, well, we can interpret a theory as a set of propositions and some of those propositions are gonna concern observable phenomena, right? Um, so in the case of something like uh, relativity theory, uh, there's a proposition about what you observe when there's an eclipse and you point a camera at the sun um, versus what you observe when, you know, you look at the stars without the sun there, right? So um, 
like that stuff can be true, but then the claims that the theory makes about, you know, the underlying structure and, uh, you know, nature of the universe, right? The, oh, okay. the stuff that's going on behind the phenomena, um, that might still be false. Uh, I guess that maybe that maybe is um, is the way to put it. I mean, so it's like, um, you know, so uh, I, I I don't know, like maybe um, you know, we we might have, for instance, a model of the sun that divides it into you know convective zone, radiative zone, right? So there's there's these different sort of zones, right, where it behaves in particular ways and. Um, this is supposed to account for, um, like, ultimately, I, I guess the, uh, I'm not actually sure how we, I shouldn't have used this example because uh, <laughs> it occurs to me, I was, I was about to describe this, like these oscillations that occur in the sun, but I'm not actually sure what the, uh, what the raw data looks like, right? <laughs> but there's some sort of raw data, right, that we observe, you know. Um, and so the, the point is just, well, um, you know, maybe there's a completely different model, right, where the interior of the sun is behaving in a completely different way, but so as to produce that same raw data. Hmm. Um, that would be the, the sort of, that would be the, the anti-realist position. <clears throat> okay. So just because an aspect of a theory or just because an empirical claim of a theory is verified doesn't mean that the theory as a whole as a whole packaged unit is now when we say true are we talking about physically true descriptively true like what do we like yeah maybe maybe elaborate on that a little bit um well, I, yeah, that's uh, that's. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, I like. I feel that um, there's not a lot of discussion of like what theory of truth we're working with, hmm. um, which might be a bit odd because I mean, I think you know, you might think, well, yeah, but surely that's kind of a central question <laughs> in this. If you're saying that, it's, but I think it's because it's like, look. Um, whatever sense we mean when we say that you know it is true that i have hands or it is true that there is a white streak in the cloud chamber right so like what do we mean when we say that's true um well that's what i mean when i say when a realist says it's true that there are electrons or it's mm -hmm. true that you know the sun is divided into a core and a convective zone and a radiative zone or etc right it's it's okay. yeah right? we, we're just using the language in the same sense i mean i mean there is there is like there is some discussion of this but it's not it's not really something that as far as i know is is like really central to the debate um so yeah it's, it's kind of hard to attribute any particular truth theory to uh to, to realists or anti-realists in general. Okay. So would you just accept that term broad spectrum, like anti-realist? Like, would you just call yourself that? Or is there a uh, specific flavor of anti-realism that you subscribe to? Um, well, I guess there is a specific flavor because as I mentioned, like when you look at sort of earlier forms of anti-realism, um, they, uh, often were committed to what I think are now quite rightly considered to be quite weird claims about the meaning of theoretical terms. Um, mm -hmm. So, I, you know, um, I, 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 I like, um, there's a, so yeah, I, I would say that, look, I think that scientific theories are tools for predicting, controlling and systematizing the observable phenomena. Um, and um, that's the flavor of anti-realist that, uh, that I am. Um, I guess it's a, a fairly sort of broad, yeah, broad approach. I, I, the reason why I'm, I'm sort of uh, like, I'm not sure how to express this is that like, 
I, I guess I, I am in, in other respects, you know, like I, 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 I could define my position more precisely, but it's just, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying then to think about how I would elaborate on that. <laughs> so I'm, I, I'm, I'm sort of uncomfortable doing that. <laughs> no worries. Sorry, that wasn't a very good response. Um, <laughs> so I am, I am, okay, for, uh, right. I am a constructive empiricist. Yep. I am, I am a relativist and uh, I am a constructivist. I'm happy with all of those terms, but they, they would probably all require you know qualifications oh it's okay so um let's do like a uh you know a high level overview of what each of those means so constructivist empiricist constructive empiricist what do you what do you mean by that yeah so um constructive empiricism um was it, it was introduced by a guy called Baz van Krassen and um it's it was I mean I think in some ways I've maybe kind of expressed it it already the constructive empiricist just says that the aim of science is uh empirical adequacy empirical adequacy is a technical term just meaning truth about the observable phenomena right so the aim of science is to provide theories that give us true descriptions of the observable phenomena um, and that means, yeah, like, like just all the observable phenomena. Okay. So we, uh, we come up with theories and we, uh, try to make sure that they, uh, produce correct predictions and we go out and test those predictions against what we observe. Right. That's constructive empiricism. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, relativist. Well, yeah. Um, so I, I think relativism, um, I would tend to see it as involving three commitments, broadly speaking. So first of all, um, there's a claim that uh, like the, the truth or justification of a belief is, uh, is, is you know, relative to some perspective. Second, that there are a plurality of different perspectives and third that there is no sort of there is no perspective independent means of judging different perspectives i think that's probably the best sort of broad statement of relativism now i think that, that you know the term relativism is kind of, is a pretty controversial term in philosophy um and elsewhere actually <laughs> Not just philosophy. A lot of people don't like the term relativism, um, but you know, I think there are kind of examples of this that that like maybe show that it's not quite as absurd as some people might think it is. So, if you look at something like like color, for example, um, different societies have different ways of carving up color space. So, uh, there are some societies which do not draw a distinction between blue and green right like that those are just taken as shades of the same color um i think you sometimes find societies where like they'll class you know like red black and gold as the same color right so there, there'll sometimes be that these really weird color classifications um <clears throat> and but you know but the point is it's like i think you know it seems pretty intuitive to say well you know it's not like there's going to be some sort of you know independently right way of classifying color i mean we happen to sort of divide things into red blue green etc but we could have carved up color space differently i mean maybe you could sort of push this a bit further and say well you know if we had different visual systems like animals do then yeah we, we'd have completely different classifications like classifications that maybe we can't even imagine right now so you know if i ask like what is the color of some object uh, what is the color of that wall behind me um that's i i mean i can i can say a, a a true claim about that i can say truly that the wall is white but that's dependent on the particular color classification scheme that i'm using and the then the argument would be well 
there's there's not like any um kind of you know it's it's not like there's there's one particular color classification scheme that is you know the one true color classification scheme okay um so that's a, a sort of case of of relativism or a kind of relativism arguably i think actually some people would object even to that example but you know hopefully that um sort of shows what's going on there right and um the reason why i um am a relativist is because um i'm i take the same sort of view towards uh uh divisions of the world in general right like we what one of the things that scientific theories do is that they provide a kind of classification of things in the world they carve up the world and i think there are uh, multiple legitimate ways of doing that let's say um so the species example i gave was an example of this right there's okay. multiple different ways of carving up things into different species yeah i, I think when I, when I hear the word relativist and when in most of the context it's brought up, it, it's usually applied to either moral relativism or like epistemological relativism where, you know, there's, there's no such thing as, as, as truth or certainty or evidence or anything like that. We just kind of spiral down this. So, yeah, I, I think that makes sense. So that, but that's not what you're saying, right? To be oh clear. well, I mean, in the I'm not I'm not making any claim for moral relativism yeah, here. Yeah, although, right. as it happens, I I am a moral <laughs> realist, and I'm quite happy with moral relativism. Um, with respect to stuff like um, you know, truth uh, and and evidence and certainty and all of that stuff, I mean, look, I, I I am in some sense a relativist about those, but I I don't think it's a sense that is sort of you know like. Okay, look, um, let me put it this way, right? I think that a lot of people, when they talk about relativism, what they usually have in mind is a claim of like equal validity, where we'd yes. be saying that like, you know, all of these different ways of thinking about the world are just equally legitimate. So like, there's no difference between science and voodoo. Um, right, 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 right. I'm, I'm certainly not saying that. Uh, <laughs> I think that's just nuts. I mean, you know, I, um, it, it, it's, and in fact, uh, I think that the, if you look at the way I defined relativism, that's actually inconsistent with equal validity. Because if you're claiming that, you know, all traditions are equally legitimate, you're claiming that there is a perspective independent means of, you know, evaluating different traditions. It just turns out that, you know, they're all equal. <laughs> yeah. So it's like not, not, none of them is superior to the other. But I think that I think science is superior to voodoo. So, yeah. Gotcha. Um, I, I do want to ask you about um, your view of ethics, but I, that's probably a different video for a different day. Um, well, there was... you know, I mean, uh, I'm always happy to talk about that. So, uh, <laughs> whenever you like, I'll have you yeah. back on again because that's uh, that's always ethics is one of those branches of philosophy. I, I tell people I'm interested in like the history of philosophy and philosophy of science. I can see the eyelids slowly start to shut, but everybody wants to talk about ethics, right? Um, there, there was one more thing that you mentioned, uh, constructive empiricist, uh, relativist, and then there was, what was the last I, one? I, constructivist. I said I would be happy with uh, all of those labels, but, um, <laughs> you know, what I said about, about relativism, I think kind of answers that already. So, um, so like with a, a sort of so the constructivism is like a constructivism about kinds and about say objects so it's it's the same point i i already made right like the the divisions in the world right divisions of things into different kinds is at least partly a product of our constructive activity um it's not like just given to us by the world itself so yeah, I was just I was just using those as like labels that are potentially controversial that you could correctly apply to my position. Um, gotcha. So one of the things I like to do, um, kind of to close out the interview, if is to ask what sort of reading recommendations you were have for people. So um, first of all, if if somebody came to you had no background prior uh, informations or dealing with philosophy and they said that they wanted to kind of uh, dip their toes a little bit what are some 
maybe intro level philosophy books, channels, aside from your own. I'll, I'll link your channel in the description of this video. By all means, go check it out. Absolutely wonderful. But what are some intro level text videos that you would suggest? And then um, reading recommendations for maybe people who want to get into the philosophy of science. Uh, I actually, um, I mean, to be honest, I don't really, I don't actually watch a lot of uh, stuff on YouTube. Um, <laughs> at least I don't watch a lot of, I'm really pleased to see philosophy kind of exploding on YouTube. It's, it's, it's great, but um, it's just like, I don't know. I, whenever I watch stuff, I'm just not in, inclined to watch philosophy. I think because <laughs> um, I just, I do it for my work and, you know, I, I always want to like to shut down and I, I, that's just right. me, you know, uh, <laughs> occupational cool. hazard. I get yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so it's, I can't really, I can't really answer that. Although like I have spoken to some other people who've got some really cool channels, you know, like I spoke to, uh, um, what's his name? There's another channel called friction. Um, I like, I like his channel a lot. Um, majesty of reason. He's more like philosophy of religion, I think, but you know, he seems, he seems pretty damn good um so yeah i mean uh i'm just trying to think I, i've spoken to other people as well but i'm just i don't have a good i don't have a good memory okay. <laughs> i feel i feel kind of kind of bad about forgetting them um <laughs> like, it's, it's just that's just the way it is with me things don't stay in my head um <laughs> So like, yeah, but the, no, the, 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 anybody that I've spoken to is probably cool. So, <laughs> um, gotcha. uh, yeah. And then for the introductory readings, for, do you mean for like philosophy in general? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure it's because I never really like when I started doing philosophy, I started, I, I didn't really um, do it that way. Like I just started with the degree and um mm. it, in a sense like you know i <laughs> i i started with the recommended readings for specific courses i, I never really picked up as like a, just a general introduction to philosophy uh i have been told that simon blackburn's think is a good general introduction to philosophy mm. lots of people have said that so <laughs> i i can't vouch for it i actually haven't <laughs> read it but i'm gonna write it down yeah you know that might work now, um, I can say a little bit more about philosophy of science, right? Uh, so for somebody who's coming to philosophy of science for the first time, I think the thing to bear in mind is that um, this is one of those areas which is, uh, it, it's, it's kind of technical, a lot of it. And um, I think there's sort of no way around really picking up something that might look like a textbook. Uh, um, so... I liked uh, Peter Godfrey Smith's book, Theory and Reality. Um, mm. what, was, uh, what was the other one that I used? Damn, I can't remember. Okay, well, never mind. Maybe it'll come to me as I'm talking. <laughs> but the, but um, another really cool one, and this is uh, related to the realism debate, and it's really, I think, well-written. It's, um, it's very entertaining. It's Ian Hacking's Representing and Intervening. I have to mm. say, like, if somebody you know, wants to explore more about realism and anti-realism and as it relates to sort of philosophy of science more generally. This book was written as an introduction to philosophy of science. It uses the realism, anti-realism debate as a way to frame it. And it's, um, it's a lot more engaging than most philosophy usually is. Uh, Ian Hacking is one of my favorite writers uh, in mm -hmm. philosophy. Um, so it's just, you know, and, and, and he's sort of, he does take a slightly different approach to a lot of philosophers of science. He's more concerned with um, elements of scientific practice. You know, philosophers of science have traditionally been quite theory oriented, but representing and intervening is, you know, like kind of concerned with these details of like what scientific practice is like. It's, it's really, it's really cool, really engaging in it. Um, so I, I think that would be a, a good, a good place to start. It's a little bit dated now because it was written in the eighties, but you know, it's, um, a lot of these philosophical problems are kind of timeless. Some of these arguments, you know, they, they crop up over and over again. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really cool. Um, and then I suppose, I don't know. I mean, you know, there are the sort of just, just kind of classic sort of, sort of texts. Um, 
you know, stuff like, uh, oh, there was, um, there's a good introduction by Carl Hempel, but I can't remember the name of it. Mm. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, Hempel solid for sure. Uh, anyway, I think I have it somewhere. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well. Anyway, so you see, I, I just as I've as I've gotten um, older, my capacity to like me me remember the names of things has just completely disappeared. I used to be so good, you know. When I was twenty, I could <laughs> I could I could remember like not just the books. I could remember the date they were written. I could remember the page the, like the number of pages they had. You know, uh, uh, I can't do that anymore. No worries. I, I think you provided some um, fantastic resources there. Um, and I just want to thank you again for coming on. I really enjoyed this conversation. I'll reach back out to you. And maybe next time we can talk about uh, talk about ethics. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, any time. <clears throat>